a mother in spite of virginity, a mother because of virginity, a father in spite of virginity, a father because of virginity. I was so excited to be able to preach on this gospel this Sunday. I thought, what a great opportunity to be able to share some of the many beautiful things that I learned about St. Joseph during our recent year of St. Joseph. I confess to you that I was, I was reading several books and as I did uh, to prepare for the, for the missions I would give, I realized that for so many years, I have failed to recognize the true greatness of St. Joseph and to pay him the honor and reverence that he deserves. You might have come across that book by Father Donald Calloway. You might have read it. Uh, it's called Consecration to St. Joseph, the Wonders of Our Spiritual Father. I highly recommend it. You will find many beautiful things about St. Joseph in that book, including the reverence theory. What's the reverence theory? Well, it's the belief that St. Joseph never suspected Mary of adultery, never suspected her of sin, and never wanted to divorce her, but as a just man, he knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecy of Isaiah that we heard in the first reading, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And he had this great sense of reverence and humility, rec recognizing, believing that Mary is the mother of the Messiah, and it seems that God is working this without me. He believed that God meant for him to withdraw from her quietly, another possible translation of that passage. Uh, one of the brothers asked me yesterday, what do you think was on St. Joseph's mind? What do you think he was thinking right before he went to sleep that night? And I said, I think he cried himself to sleep. I think he cried himself to sleep, believing that, wow, uh, 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 it was t too good to be true. Right? Mary is the mother of the Messiah. Uh, God is not pleased by my love for her and the thought that he had to withdraw himself. That must have just crushed his heart, especially after God had infused that heart with so much love for Mary. And then we can imagine that he cried tears of joy, that he cried himself to sleep, he cried himself awake with tears of joy after that annunciation in that dream that, yes, this is God's plan from all eternity. He means for St. Joseph to have this beautiful role. Now today I would like to share with you, and I want to, yeah, we touch on that, but I want to share with you something that I found only in another book written by a Dominican priest named Father Dominic de Dominico. This book is called True Devotion to St. Joseph and to the Church. And within that book, I found this beautiful understanding of how St. Joseph is a real father to Jesus. We emphasize so much in the Catholic Church that he was not the biological father of Jesus, that he had nothing to do bodily with the conception of Jesus. And with this, we can end up not thinking of him as a real father. We can fall into that error of thinking that physical, bodily, fatherhood, or motherhood is the only real kind. Father Dominic in that book helps us understand that parenthood comes with two bonds. That fatherhood and motherhood naturally involves two bonds. The first is the, the bodily bond to the child, but he says along with that comes a moral bond to the child. This is something I had never heard about. What is the moral bond to a son or daughter? It refers to the rights and responsibilities between parent and child. Uh, rights and responsibilities that God will call into account on the day of our judgment. Did you honor your father and mother? Did you guide your children to the kingdom of heaven? This moral bond St. Joseph had. Mary, we recognize, had both bonds, the physical and the moral. In St. Joseph, we emphasize again, he had not the physical bond to Jesus as his father, but yes, he had this moral bond. And Father Dominic goes through several reasons why we can understand him to have this moral bond to Jesus as his son. We don't have time to go through them all, but I'll present some of the most compelling. First, there's the reason by virtue of his marriage to Mary. 
We read in that gospel that she was already betrothed to him when she became pregnant with Jesus. And betrothal for the Jews was not a simple engagement. After the betrothal, the woman was known as the wife of that man. She was legally his wife. God could have had the incarnation happen out, uh, before the marriage, but God allowed it to happen when she was already his wife. And when it comes to marriage, husband and wife have rights over each other's bodies. They belong to each other, body and soul. And so a husband has rights to the fruit of the body of his wife. So Mary, conceiving Jesus while she was St. Joseph's wife, the fruit of her womb also belongs to him. St. Francis de Sales uses an analogy to help us understand this. He says, if there is a dove that is flying over a garden and it is carrying a piece of fruit, perhaps a date, and as it flies over that garden, it ends up dropping that date in the garden and it ends up being planted in the ground and grows to become a tree, we can ask the question, whose tree is that? Well, whoever owns the garden now owns the tree. <laughs> and we could understand Mary as a sacred garden entrusted to St. Joseph as his wife and the fruit of that garden, Jesus also belongs to St. Joseph. Francis de Sales writes, divine union between Our Lady and the glorious Saint Joseph, by means of this union, that good of eternal goods, our Lord himself belonged to Saint Joseph as well as to Our Lady. So that's one reason, he is a true father. But a second reason is by virtue of his consent to have children at the wedding. We know that a valid marriage requires the consent of the couple of openness to life, that they will accept children from God. St. Joseph had that consent to whatever children God might bring into this marriage, even if it seemed impossible. And that consent was present at the Annunciation to Mary. When the angel announces to Mary that she will become the mother of the Son of God and she gives her consent, we can understand the consent of Saint Joseph to be present there as well. Let us not think that Mary at the Annunciation gave no thought to Saint Joseph or, well, what's Saint Joseph gonna think? Well, who cares? <laughs> this is for me here. Uh, no, Mary knew that Saint Joseph would have wanted her to say yes that he also was open to children within this marriage, however God might make that happen. At the same moment that she became a mother, Saint Joseph became a father at that moment of the Annunciation, even though he would only learn of it later. The third reason that is my f most favorite <laughs> is by virtue of Saint Joseph's virginity and by virtue of being guardian of Mary's virginity, he is a true father to Jesus with that moral bond to him. We find in the teaching of the church that Saint Joseph was not a widower. You might have heard that myth that he was a widower and this is where we uh, can explain the so-called brothers and sisters of Jesus. Uh, no, we know we don't need to do that. Uh, the word Adelphoi has a much broader meaning than blood brothers or sisters. Uh, but also we find the teaching within the church throughout the centuries that Saint Joseph, not only did he live a virginal marriage with Mary, but that he had also been a virgin his whole life. Venerable Mary of Agrida, in her private revelations, of course we do not have to believe these, but uh, private revelations from Our Lady, uh, she presents what Saint Joseph said when he learned of Mary's vow of virginity. Uh, she would have had to tell him in order for it to be a valid marriage for him to consent freely to this. And she presents him as saying, I desire thee to know, lady, that at the age of 12 years, I also made a promise to serve the Most High in perpetual chastity. On this account, I now gladly ratify this vow in order not to impede thy own. St. Francis de Sales says it, both Mary and Joseph had made a vow to remain virgins all the days of their lives. 
And because he was virgin, because he consented to this virginal marriage, we could say that he is responsible for the, for the virginal conception of Jesus. That can sound a little weird. Usually when we say that a man is responsible for a conception, who's responsible for this child? We usually mean that there were bodily marital relations. Uh, but we can say this of St. Joseph, that he was responsible for that conception without having those bodily relations. How so? Because God from all eternity willed to be born of a virgin. Well, she has to remain a virgin for that to happen, and that depended on St. Joseph's consent. St. Joseph, in consenting to, to keep and protect her virginity within that marriage, he ends up becoming a cause of the virginal conception. St. Augustine writes of this. He says, a son was born of the Virgin Mary to the piety uh, and love of St. Joseph. And that son was the son of God. Did you hear it? Did you catch it? We can pull out of that phrase, a son was born of Mary to Joseph. Again, usually when we say a son is born of a woman to a man, we're implying that there was the bodily union. But St. Augustine says this of St. Joseph, knowing that that union did not take place. He says, for just as she was a virginal wife, so was he a virginal husband. Just as she was a virginal mother, so was he a virginal father. And I love this next part. He says, the Holy Spirit gave a son to both. The Holy Spirit gave a son to both. So yes, they both became a mother and father at that moment of the Annunciation. Beautiful teachings, beautiful understandings. This helped me to have so much greater respect and reverence for St. Joseph, right? Not just a man, not just a stand-in father, not a fake father, but yes, a real father with those rights and responsibilities over Jesus as his son, right? God commanding him to name Jesus. If anyone has the right to name the incarnate son of God, it's God the Father, and yet he commands St. Joseph to do so. He makes him a real father. What does this have to do with us today? Well, we can recognize and celebrate through these teachings the beautiful fruitfulness of virginity. Let us recognize and celebrate the fruitfulness of virginity. In the prayer over the gifts, we're going to hear the words, the Holy Spirit filled with power the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Filled with power, the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes, there is a fruitfulness to virginity. Even on a natural level, we can recognize a life-giving uh, uh, fruitfulness of virginity. Uh, when, when young people hold on to their virginity until marriage, this helps foster that sacrificial love that they need for that total gift of self, body and soul in marriage. It helps lead, it lead to that life-giving love within marriage. Uh, holding on to their virginity helps ensure that no children are going to be conceived outside of marriage that perhaps won't have the benefit of growing up with both their father and mother. So on that natural level, virginity is life-giving. It leads to life but also on the, the supernatural level. All the more we can understand virginity to be life-giving, to be fruitful. In Mary and Joseph's case, yes, their virginal marriage produced the fruit of the incarnation, the incarnate Son of God. And souls who are called to that, to that vocation of perpetual virginity or consecrated celibacy, all the more so can they share in in that spiritual maternity of Mary. Uh, we are all meant to help lead souls to Jesus, to help bring them to the sacraments, to help them come to the point of being born again, of being born of God, of becoming literally sons and daughters of God through sanctifying grace in their soul that share in divine life. So we're all meant to cooperate in this, but those who are called to a vocation of perpetual virginity 
they receive all the more power from God to cooperate in souls being born through grace. Right? We don't see it, but yes, they are responsible for the conception of sons and daughters of God through the sacraments. There was a priest that I knew at Notre Dame, and one time when he was traveling abroad, there was a woman who asked him, how many children do you have? And he said, many. <laughs> Yes, many. Only in heaven will those souls know all the other souls that they affected, that they helped bring to life and grace through their vows of virginity, of consecrated celibacy. Those in the early church understood this. Right? The virgin martyrs that we mention in the Eucharistic prayer one, the Roman canon, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, these were all women who recognized the power of virginity, the beauty of virginity, the beauty of imitating our Lord and our Blessed Mother, imitating St. Joseph. They were ready to hold on to the virginity even until death, suffering, torture, martyrdom, to be able to hold on to sacred virginity. And, uh, and the early churches, the young men as well, were so ready to embrace perpetual continence, even those who were married going in, into ordained ministry, were ready to embrace perpetual continence and no longer have those relations with their wives. The great value of virginity, it, it has been lost in our time and we need to reclaim it. Right? In our time, virginity is ridiculed and scoffed at, seen as something to, to dread holding on to for too long. Well, we need to help instill it in our children all the more that uh, if they're called to marriage, Virginity is one of the most beautiful gifts that they can give to their spouse the night of their wedding. Uh, we want to encourage them to consider the, a vocation to consecrated celibacy, to perpetual virginity, to recognize this as a precious gift from God. That's what the church teaches, that it is a gift to be embraced. We want to encourage them in that great battle for purity to do everything we can to fight against the scourge of pornography or sins of self-abuse, to en encourage recourse to the sacrament of confession when we fall, to never become discouraged, to stand up again, to rise with the help of God. This is possible to live these beautiful virtues. Uh, those in marriage, uh, to be able to, to embrace, if the time should come, perpetual continence. Perhaps the majority of couples at one time or another are going to reach a point where they are no longer able to celebrate that marital embrace. And we don't want to be like children who had our toys taken away. No, we want to be like St. Joseph who did not resent a virginal marriage. St. Joseph was not like, oh, okay, fine, I'll, I'll live a virginal marriage, but hey, wait a minute, that means I don't get to have my husbandly rights. Uh, no, St. Joseph saw it as a privilege to be able to make that sacrifice for Mary. Oh, just give me that chance right, to show my great love for her. And he saw it as a privilege to be guardian of her virginity. So we want to summon men to be men like St. Joseph to see it as an honor, a privilege to protect the virginity and purity of all women out there, especially our wives if we are married. Invoking the aid of Mary, virgin most pure, of mother most chaste, invoking the aid of Saint Joseph, most chaste guardian of the virgin, let us be like an army marching boldly against the enemies of virginity and chastity, singing a joyful and triumphant hymn God was born of a virgin, God was born by a virgin, by a virgin ever chaste.